Let's encourage one another. Let's continue to invest in our church and reaching the lost. All of heaven is cheering us on. The time of our departure is coming quickly. The finish line is closer than we think. So let's join with the Apostle Paul and fight the good fight. Let's run the race. Let's keep the faith because Jesus is coming soon. Well, good morning. Welcome to Westside this morning, and welcome to those who are online. Join us. I'm sorry. North Broadway. Westside's where I grew up. Welcome to North Broadway this morning, and welcome to those who are online. Thank you. It's just a test to see if you're listening. Before I go any further, I would like to thank uh, our Minister of Pastoral Care for uh, bringing the message last Sunday, the first Sunday of the new year. And uh, what a good reminder at a time when we look back on a year that was on, on God's uh, faithfulness and all that we have been through, uh, that um, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And at a time when there's uncertainty, we're looking into the new year, we don't know what the year is going to hold, we can claim that. And his word endures forever. Uh, and then next week... We are looking forward to uh, Pastor Donald Calder being back with us. Hey there, North Broadway family. Hope you're doing well. Haven't seen you since the calendar year change. So let me say Happy New Year's to each and every one of you. I'm down in Florida visiting family, but looking forward to joining you next Sunday. So let me be the first one to remind you and invite you to our brand new series that we're kicking off called Portable Wisdom, a study through the book of Proverbs. Every day, you and I are making decisions here, there, this, or that. And who doesn't want 2022 to be a year of better decisions and less regrets? And the book of Proverbs offers so much wisdom in every part of life, whether it's your personal life, your social life, your family life, your financial life, your spiritual life. It touches on all areas. So I hope you'll join us next week as we kick off our series, Portable Wisdom. So we're looking forward to him being back next week. So let's just open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your word and the truth that it is. Lord, we just ask that you will speak your words to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you have a favorite Bible story? Or do you have a a favorite Bible character who you like to to think about or, or reflect on? Have you ever found yourself wishing you could go back to the Bible times to witness one of your favorite Bible characters? People like Moses, who split the Red Sea with his staff, or maybe Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who refused to bow down to that 90-foot image and were thrown into the fiery furnace. But right in time, God came and saved them and showed his power. Or maybe when it was uh, Elijah on Mount Carmel, with the priests of Baal, when he called down fire from heaven. Do you ever just think it would have been great to be there? Do you see these events in action? Or maybe you think you wish you could have been one of these people. People like Moses or Daniel or the Apostle Paul to be called a Bible legend. This Bible is full of accounts and examples over thousands of years of God working in and through people of faith to accomplish his mighty works and plans for redemption. When I grew up, we had a series on video called Superbook. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. The storyline always involves this boy and girl named Chris and Joy and their robot named Gizmo. And on each show, they travel back in time to a different Bible time. They meet the main character and they are there and involved throughout the big event that that particular show is about. 
By the end of the show, they are safely transported back home and they reflect and talk about their visit to the Bible times. But what about us today? Does God still work today with us the way he did in Bible times? Does he still interact or communicate with people the same way he did then? Does he still talk to us? And how do we know his plans for us? And what does the Bible have to say about the the times we're living in now? Amazingly, the answer is yes. And Pastor Allen touched on this last week, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. His word endures forever. Yes, he is still working in us and through us. Yes, he still interacts and communicates with us, primarily through his word and the Holy Spirit. Yes, he plans for us. Yes, his word has told us everything we need to know about the times we're living in now. And even into the future and beyond now. We just came through the Christmas season and were reminded of and celebrated the long-awaited birth of the Messiah, the first coming of Christ. God communicated this through the Old Testament prophets who wrote down what they were told so that people would know what to look for and how to recognize his coming. Things like the virgin birth in Isaiah 7, 14. We see this fulfilled in Luke 1, 35. And God's son would live in Egypt, Hosea 11, verse 1. Again, fulfilled in Matthew 2, 13 through 15. And the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5, verse 2. Fulfilled in Matthew 2, 4 through 6. And there are many prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. In fact, there are hundreds about his birth, about his life, about how he would teach in parables, how he would reach the Gentiles, that he would be rejected, his betrayal for 30 pieces of silver, his death in great detail, like how not one bone in his body would be broken, and that he would be pierced, and that he would resurrect. My point is, is that God communicated with 100% accuracy through his word about the coming of Jesus, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, and his role as high priest in the church. His word is truth, it can be understood, and it can be trusted. We look back and see in the birth of Jesus and wonder, how, how did these people miss this? They had this all written down for them from several different prophets. It's right there. It can be understood. If they had just read the scrolls or listened to the prophets of God or if they had just prepared their hearts, the Messiah would be born of a virgin and he was literally born of a virgin. He would be born in Bethlehem and he was literally born in Bethlehem. He would live in Egypt and as a little boy, he lived in Egypt. He'd be called a Nazarene and he was literally Jesus of Nazareth. And the list goes on and on. The Bible also is very clear about the world and what it will look like when Jesus comes back again. It goes into great detail. And with each passing year and day, we look and see more and more, detail for detail, God's word unfolding all around us. With each passing day, this generation is looking more and more like the generation described to us by those Old Testament prophets and writers of the New Testament and Jesus himself. There are Bible scholars and preachers and teachers in agreement right now saying that there is so much Bible prophecy unfolding around us right now that we are literally living in Bible times. All of this is pointing to the soon appearing of Jesus Christ and when he comes for his church, his bride, Jesus is coming soon. I have to tell you, this topic was the central obsession of the church fathers. This was the hope that was proclaimed by Jesus himself. It was written by the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John. It was prophesied by Ezekiel. It was prophesied by Isaiah. 
It was taught by Jesus in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 and Luke 21 over and over and over again. Jesus taught that even though he was going to be seated at the right hand of the Father, that the day of his appearing is imminent. The writers of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, Jude, Peter, James, John, Matthew, all had their hearts, their minds, and their eyes set on this glorious hope of the appearing of Jesus. And so should we. It's the reality of Scripture. Jesus is coming soon. It's not just make-believe. It's not an I hope so. It's not maybe if God's in a good mood. It's a promise of Scripture. And that's why the Bible calls it our blessed hope. Paul states this in Titus 2.13. We are waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's the blessed hope of the church. Jesus says in John 14, 1 through 4, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Jesus is coming soon. So maybe you're joining us today and hearing this for the first time, or maybe you've heard this and you're wondering where the Bible says all this. Maybe you're sitting there saying, this sounds great, but how can you be so sure? Well, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, this account, this Bible account is laid out for us. And you see, you have to understand what God, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's not limited by anything. He's not limited by time. He's not limited by space. And when he gives an account of something, whether it's already happened, like maybe creation or something like that, it's the truth. It's an account. It's happened. When he gives us an account through uh, the Old Testament prophets about Jesus' first coming, we know now we're on the other side of it. We know it's happened. But just as sure as creation happened, Jesus came the first time. And he's given us an event, an account, what is yet still future. You can take it to the bank. It's his word. It's going to happen. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so, we will always be with the Lord. That's the event. That's the biblical account. Still to happen. It's going to happen. Here's the direction to the church. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. The following is a, a quote from Billy Graham. There's a great deal to say in the Bible about the signs we are to watch for. And when these signs all converge at one place, we can all be sure that we are close to the end of the age. That's the church age. And those signs, in my judgment, are converging now for the first time since Jesus made those predictions. God keeps his promises, and this is why we can be sure that the return of Christ is near. Scripture says, that there will be signs pointing to the return of the Lord. And I believe all these signs are evident today. And that was just about a year before Billy Graham passed away, a few years ago. Jesus has told us that there is a generation, a generation that sees all these things, will not pass away until all these things take place. In Luke 21, verse 32. Please understand, there's one generation who will see all this and his coming. So what does that mean? What it means is Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. One pastor recently said, we are no longer seeing the signs of the times. We're living in the time of the signs. Think about that. We could spend hours discussing God's prophetic word coming to pass, 
not just in some areas of the world, but converging on a global scale in this generation in ways it has never before. We could talk all afternoon about very specific details God told us he would be doing and how the world will look in the last hour. I will just name off a few this morning. In the nation of Israel, being born in a day, this is Isaiah 66, verse 8. We've seen this fulfilled. An event, an account on May 14th, 1948. The miraculous regathering of the Jews to the land of Israel. Israel's population has literally been booming. A 7,700% increase from 100 years ago. No other nation can say that. Jerusalem being reunified after Six-Day War in 1967. In 2017, on the 50th year Jubilee anniversary, America recognized Jerusalem before the whole world as the capital of Israel. God is moving. The time of the Gentiles is nearing its end as the time of Jacob's trouble approaches. Global leaders are pressing for peace and security as the search for one who will bring peace continues. The increase in human knowledge that Daniel says will come in the time of the end. Think of the transportation, communication, AI, weapons, weapons of mass destruction, medical advances, and the list goes on and on. This generation has had that explosion of human knowledge. Increased volcanic action, increased flooding, increased droughts, increased fires, increased famine in poverty-stricken lands. Call it what you want, global warming. Jesus says it's birth pains. Wars and rumors of wars around the globe. Just to name a few in the headlines. And here's the problem, they're not in the headlines. Russia and Ukraine and Belarus. China and Taiwan and Kashmir, Pakistan, Afghanistan, North Korea, South Korea, Ethiopia, Sudan, Israel, and Iran. There's drug wars, ethnic wars, gang wars. The love of many is growing cold. Dozens of churches were burned to the ground in Canada this past year. The days are like Lot's, the days are like Noah's. Men and women have given up the unnatural for the unnatural. What is good is called wrong. What is wrong is called good. Just look at the letter we had to read this morning from the fellowship. People have been given over to a debased mind. Churches are compromising truth to gain popularity. False teachers are everywhere you look. We see peace treaties being signed between Israel and Arab nations. Great. But when in history has the Arab nation been interested in peace with Israel? It's all happening. We see these signs converging. God's word is, is coming true in our generation again. In Revelation 22, verse 7, Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Interesting. That word comes from the word tacos. Not taco, like Taco Bell. Tacos, which is the Greek word we get our word tachometer from. A tachometer is used for measuring RPMs. Every one of you has it in your car. 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 RPM when you rev your engine. What Jesus is saying here is, behold, I'm coming when things are revving up. In Luke 21, 28, Jesus says, when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. He's saying when you start seeing these things, make sure you're ready. So what do we do about it? Well, in a few verses later, in verse 36, Jesus says in, in the same context, stay alert at all times. Be watching, praying that you will escape all that is about to happen and that you will be able to stand before the Son of Man. For us to see these things begin to take place, which he says we'll be able to in verse 28, then according to verse 36, we need to be alert, we need to be watching, we need to be praying, and I would add, waiting expectantly. In Matthew 25, 1 through 13, Jesus tells the parable of the ten virgins waiting for the bridegroom. In verse 10, 
He says, the virgins that were ready went with him to the wedding banquet. And the door was shut on the virgins who were not ready. That's exactly what it says. And the direction comes from Jesus then in verse 13. Therefore, keep watch. Be on the alert. Because you do not know the day or the hour. So many people get hung up on, you do not know the day or the hour. I agree. Nobody does. But that's not what you should be getting hung up on. The direction is, keep watch. We have just come through the Christmas season and are now in a new year. And that first Christmas was what? It was the first coming of Christ. And we can learn from the first coming as we, the church, are waiting for him to come back for us. So I want to do that for a couple minutes this morning. I want to be ready when Jesus comes back. I want you to be ready when Jesus comes back. We want North Broadway to be ready. We want your families to be ready. We want your neighbors to be ready, your coworkers, your friends. So let's take a couple minutes and look at some of these characters who missed Jesus at his first coming. The innkeeper missed Jesus, even though it happened on his own property. Why? He was too busy. The place was packed. There was no room, not even for a woman about to give birth. And as a result, Mary had to give birth outside in a stable. And she, was, she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger. Now, I'm not suggesting the innkeeper was mean or hostile towards Mary and Joseph. But in the rush of the times, he was too busy. He was caring for his guests and his household, and he was going, not going to slow down, even for a woman in labor. He was too busy. There's a lot of people like that, isn't there? They get all wrapped up in the busyness of life. You know how it is. Day after day, it's a fast-paced life. Call it the rat race. So much time gets preoccupied and it squeezes out time with Christ. Before we know it, another day goes by where we spent no time in prayer, no time in his word, no time with Jesus. I want us to look at our own lives and ask ourselves, do we spend time on meaningless things than we do with Christ? Do we spend more money on useless stuff than we do investing in his kingdom? Am I too busy with everything that amounts to nothing? So many people are so busy that they miss Jesus day after day. They miss Christ over and over because of this problem. They were too busy. And the sad thing is, one day they're going to wake up and wonder, where did all the time go? Have you ever asked yourself that? I hear it. I hear it often. Where did all the years go? Where did all the time go? The innkeeper missed Jesus because he was too busy. Herod, he's another one. He definitely missed Christmas. He missed Jesus at his first coming. Herod was confronted by the Magi from the east about the birth of the king of the Jews. And he was troubled. And it's, the Bible says all of Jerusalem was troubled with him. You know why? Because he was troubled. He was troubled. He was stirred up. He was shaken up. He was extremely agitated. Fear captivated Herod. He was insecure. He was a political man. He was not a Jew, but he was placed in power over the Jews by Rome. His throne was in Judea. And he was insecure, a self-centered man, and he murdered anyone who would threaten his place of power. He was a madman driven crazy by insecurity and fear. He would do anything to avoid losing his throne. So he met with the Magi from the east and he told them, go and find the king of the Jews. And when you find him, come back to me so that I can worship him. Herod was cunning and deceitful. You might notice that he never told them to worship him. And after being warned by God in a dream 
uh, not to return to Herod, the Magi went home another way. And when Herod realized this, he was, that he was fooled, he went on a massive, murderous manhunt. He was propelled by jealous fear. And he commanded that every male child, two and under, be murdered. He marked the first coming of Jesus with bloodshed, innocent bloodshed. Herod's fear was that someone else would take his throne. He was not about to let this child take his throne. He was not about to let someone else replace him as king. There's people like that, a lot of people. They reject Christ because of the same basic fear that possessed Herod. These people are afraid to let someone else take their throne. They are not about to let someone be their king. They're caught up in living their lives the way they want to, going where they want to go, doing what they want to do. They don't answer to anyone. They're not about to let Jesus be their king. They're not willing to give up the throne of their little kingdom. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that we need to confess Jesus as Lord. If we confess Jesus as Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's a world of kings and queens who are not about to bow the knee to Jesus. Herod missed Christmas because of his fear. Jealous fear. Then there's the chief priests and scribes. These men were the best of all the priests. They had all the skills, the great leadership skills, the great administrative skills. They were the great minds, the brain thrusts, the theologians, the theological brains of the day. They knew all the scriptures. And we just discussed that Herod in his troubled state called these men together and asked them, where's the Messiah going to be born? And they knew the answer. They said to him, they quoted the prophet Micah, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. The Messiah is the one man who these guys have been looking for their whole history. They've been looking for their deliverer to deliver them from their oppressors since the days of Moses. Here were the men who have been waiting, studying, searching. They've longed for the one. The destiny of Israel was bound up in the one to come. The Christ, the Messiah, the great hope of all the ages, and here were the men who knew it all. And yet, they never even bothered to walk a few miles to see if it was not the Christ. Why? They didn't care. They were indifferent. Their lives were comfortable. They didn't need a savior. They were not truly looking for a Messiah. They were not truly looking for the Messiah. They were self-righteous. They kept the law. In their own eyes, they were perfect. And they just didn't care. These men were proud men, too busy with themselves to look for the Christ. There are people around us like that, unfortunately, even in churches. Self-righteous, self-sufficient, wrapped up in themselves. They don't need the Messiah. They don't want him. They're too into themselves. And they're too interested in pointing the finger at other people's problems or faults instead of looking inward. In fact, when he did show up, they hated him. They schemed and plotted his murder. They wanted his blood. The Bible says they yelled, crucify him. They hated him. We all know somebody like these guys patting themselves on the back with every good deed they do and pointing out the problems with everybody else in the world. The problem with indifference is they don't realize the state of their sinfulness. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
Again, there's people around us like this today. They don't know that the wage of their sin is death. And that sin separates them from Christ and is leading them to an eternal hell. So they ignore the remedy because they don't recognize the disease. I don't know about you, but the more time I spend with the Lord, and the more aware I become of who, who He is, the more aware I become of my sin and who I am and how far I am from Him. I feel more conviction and recognize more and more the absolute desperate need I have of the Savior. And I'm thankful for this conviction that he brings on me because it's that conviction, that work of the Holy Spirit that reminds us of the assurance of salvation and the ongoing sanctification process that he is working out in me. That reminds me that I am his and he's preparing me for eternity with him. So the world is full of these three types of people. Too busy, they don't realize the hour in which they live. Too jealous, fearful to give up control of their lives, to give up the throne of their tiny kingdoms. An indifferent pride, they don't recognize their sin, so they don't care for the Savior. The message this morning is, Jesus is coming soon. So the question I have for you is, are you ready for this? Many people fall into the category of one of these three people. There were people that were ready. You can look through the the Christmas story, the, the Magi from the East, and the shepherds, and there's Simeon, and the prophetess Anna. They were all eager and ready for the first coming of Christ. When you look at their different stories and what was happening in their lives, you will see that they were humble people. They were actively seeking God. They were obedient. But there's one common denominator amongst them. They believed. And their lives reflected that. In Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, verse 6 through 8, the Apostle Paul is finishing his last letter. He lets Timothy know that the time of his departure has come. It's a tearjerker. But he says, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. Now listen to this part. And not only to me, but also to all who loved his appearing. Do you love his appearing? I have to ask myself that too. From God's word, we do know the season of his coming. We are told to watch and will recognize this generation. I'm not going to ever try and tell you when that's going to happen. And if you ever hear somebody do that, turn them off because they're wrong. But what I am going to say is we need to be ready. And we need to be ready now. So are we ready? Let me tell you, he's not coming back for a girlfriend. He's coming back for a bride. He's not coming back for a people who who date the church He's coming back for a bride. He's not coming back for people who don't have oil in their lamps. The door is going to be shut on them. He's coming back when you least expect him. Are we ready? Are you watching for him? Or or have you been too busy, too occupied, or not interested? Or have you had your head stuck in the sand, or... Convinced yourself everything is as it always has been. That's a direct Bible prophecy, by the way. Are you praying that you will not be deceived in the last hour in a time of great deception? 
When, we, when Jesus was approached by his disciples about the signs of the end, the first thing Jesus said to them before he gave them the signs was, see that no one deceives you. In the context of the final hour of the last days. Are you praying for strength so you won't compromise under pressure? Do you love his appearing? Or are you still holding on to the world real tight? For those of you who are ready, that's great. The trumpet's about to sound, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet him in the air. And we will be with the Lord forever. Amen? And in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. Glory to God. Glory to God. One of these days, we're going to be gathering around the throne in heaven. And this is the part where Paul says, encourage each other with this. We're going to join the four living creatures and the 24 elders and the myriads and myriads of people and angels singing to the king of kings and crying out and shouting, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now listen to what they're saying. This is from Revelation chapter 4. Who was, who is, and who is to come. They're saying it right now in heaven. When we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout the victory, the songwriter says. And thank you, God, for the grace that you gave me, the strength when I needed it. Thank you, God, that I never gave up. Thank God that I wasn't deceived in the final hour. And thank God that I didn't compromise under pressure. Thank you, God. Friends, we are literally living in Bible times. This is our chance to be the Bible Times legend that you always thought you might have been. There are no do-overs. This is it. Let's give it everything we got. Let's put on our armor. Let's read our Bibles. Let's set our mind on things above, as Paul says. Let's hold each other up in prayer. Let's encourage one another. Let's continue to invest in our church and reaching the lost. All of heaven is cheering us on. The time of our departure is coming quickly. The finish line is closer than we think. So let's join with the Apostle Paul and fight the good fight. Let's run the race. Let's keep the faith because Jesus is coming soon. But if you're here this morning and you're not sure you're ready, now's the time to make sure you are ready. And if there's something in your life that's keeping you from receiving Jesus as your Savior, you need to ask yourself if it's really worth it. This is the most important decision of our lives. And I urge you not to put it off any longer. The Bible says, today is the day of salvation. You don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't even know if you have a tomorrow. You don't want to delay this decision because Jesus is coming soon. So turn now to Jesus. Turn now to Jesus and confess him as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your redemptive plan. Thank you for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that in your word you have told us what you're doing. You've told us that you're in control. You've told us, Lord, that you are coming back for your church to bring us home that we will be with you forevermore. Lord, and our, our circumstances down here do not change your word. Nothing changes your word. Thank you that we can trust it. 
Lord, if there's anyone here today, I pray that you will work in their hearts, Lord, if they are not sure where they stand with you. Lord, convict their hearts, open their eyes to their desperate need that they have of the Savior. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. I invite you to stand with us as we close this morning. Joining our broadcast today of Hope of Glory, presented by North Broadway Baptist Church in Tilsonburg, Ontario. If you have any questions about today's service or any prayer requests, please let us know. Our email is northbroadwaychurch 
at gmail.com or you can send us a private message on Facebook or Instagram. To find out more information about us, you can check out our website at northbroadwaychurch.ca. There you can also find out about special events and different ministries for kids, youth, and adults. From everyone here at North Broadway, thank you. And we look forward to having you join us again next week.